Good morning and welcome back to our study of the Gospel of Mark. We are now into the third month of 2021 and as I have commented before, this year is just getting away so very quickly. Uh, Scott picked up on a comment that I made in last week's class uh, and since that I was trying to get finished with the Gospel of Mark, thinking that we needed to end the study by the end of the month. And he reminded me that because of our current situation with, with Bible classes and because of uh, the flexibility that we now have, he said, don't feel like you need to finish by the end of March. We can take some Sundays in April as well. So that's going to allow us to slow down the pace. I don't feel like we've got to cover uh, Mark chapters 10 through 16 in the next four weeks. So hopefully today we'll get through much of chapter 10, but we'll be able to take a more leisurely pace than I thought we were going to be able to do. So we'll pick up this morning in Mark chapter 10, verse 1. Then Jesus left that place and went into the region of Judea across the Jordan, over on the east side of the Jordan River. And this would have been within the region of Perea, uh, an area that interestingly is a part of the oversight and, and uh, sovereignty of Herod Antipas. And that may well play into the question that the Pharisees come to Jesus with. But we're told that crowds of people came to Jesus across the Jordan, and as was his custom, he taught them. We have a, a parallel to this entire section uh, in Mark in Matthew chapter 19, and we'll be making some references to that as well as to uh, Matthew chapter 5 and Deuteronomy chapter 24. But in Matthew 19, it says that Jesus also healed the people. Mark says he was teaching them. Uh, Matthew says that, that he healed them there. And that is just so typical of Jesus. That's what we find him doing in so many places with so many groups of people. He continues to give them spiritual bread, the bread of life. He continues to teach them about uh, the kingdom of of God and its nearness and the ethics and the values of the kingdom and the demands of the kingdom of God. But he's also so compassionate toward their physical needs. So he's teaching, he's healing, and then some Pharisees come. They're not coming to be taught. They're not coming to be healed. They're coming to test Jesus. They're trying uh, to entrap him. They're trying to trip him up in his words. They're trying to take something Jesus will say and weaponize it against him. So their question is, verse 2, some Pharisees came and tested Jesus by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? If you look at the parallel in Matthew chapter 19, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Um, perhaps they are wanting to get Jesus to answer in a way that somewhat echoed what John the Baptist would have said. And we remember what John told Herod Antipas about his marriage, his relationship with Herodias. Herodias was Herod's niece. She was his former sister-in-law. She had been married to Herod's brother, Philip, and she had divorced Philip. Uh, Herod had divorced his wife so that they could marry one another. And John said, it's not lawful for you to have her. It results in John initially being put in prison. And then because of the persistence uh, of the hatred of Herodias toward him, uh, because of the, the foolish boast that he makes at his birthday party in response to the dance of Herodias's daughter, uh, Herodias gets John's head on a platter. Um, John the Baptist was destroyed because of what he had proclaimed, what he had taught in regard to Herod and Herodias's marriage. Perhaps they can get Jesus to answer in a way that will lead to him being destroyed as well. That's ultimately what they want to do. So they come to him with this question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Some people obviously believe that. Some people obviously taught that. So Jesus, first of all, takes them to the law. What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. 
Uh, we'll talk about various interpretations of that in, in the days of Jesus, but I think it's helpful to go back and look at what that text actually says, what God reveals through Moses in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. There it reads, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, um, because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, uh, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. There were two primary reasons why this provision was in the law. We're going to learn later that the entirety of it, the reason why it's there in the first place, wasn't because of God's original intent for marriage, but because of the hardness of people's hearts. It's an accommodation uh, for the weakness of mankind, but it had been interpreted by uh, many people in Jesus's day as being very permissive in nature, uh, just a, a blank check for men to send away their wives and give them a certificate of divorce. Uh, rather than being permissive, uh, first of all, in the law, it was protective. Uh, it allowed the woman to have some means of being uh, provided for if her husband uh, just tired of her and sent her away. Without a certificate of divorce, she could not have married anyone else. And so it's, it's given as a protection for women, but also uh, as a preventative measure to cause these men to realize you'd better think long, you'd better think hard before you do this. Because if you do this um, at, in a reactionary way, if you don't think it through, uh, remember if you send her away, you cannot take her back. Uh, in New Testament scripture, the idea of reconciliation is going to be encouraged, but under the law, they're reminded, uh, be careful about flippantly sending your wife away with the certificate of divorce, because if, if her next husband sends her away or if he dies, you cannot take her back as uh, your wife. So it was intended to be protective. It was pretended to, uh, intended to be preventative or prohibitive, but it was interpreted in a very, very permissive way. Uh, there were two prominent um, rabbis in the time of Jesus. One of them died about the time Jesus's ministry began. One of them died a few years before Jesus's ministry began. But this indecency, this uncleanness that a man might find in his wife, as uh, stipulated in Deuteronomy 24, was interpreted in radically different ways. Uh, one of these rabbis' name uh, was, was Hillel, the other was Shammai. Uh, the school of Hillel, in regard to the law, took a very permissive view, a very loose interpretation of the law, and Hillel and his disciples taught that any indecency, any uncleanness would be just anything at all uh, that he didn't like about his wife, including the spoiling of a meal, what we would call burning the toast. He can just write a certificate of divorce and, and send her away. The school of Shammai took a more uh, conservative view of the law, a more literal view of the law and restrictive view. And it, Shammai's uh, interpretation was that was some moral indecency. This was sexual immorality. So the question for Jesus is, um, who is right? Is Hillel right? And you can just divorce your wife for any and every reason. So what did Moses command you? Uh, Jesus asked. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. That's what's in Deuteronomy 24. Uh, Jesus's reply to them was, there was something in the mind of God before what was written in Deuteronomy 24, and it was his, his intent from creation. It was, because of your, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. 
Jesus replied, uh, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. This is Genesis 1, 27. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. That's Genesis 2, 24, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus says, what was uh, written uh, by Moses in Deuteronomy 24 was an accommodation by God for the hardness of men's hearts, the resistance of men's hearts, the weakness in men's hearts. That was not his desire uh, for marriage. His desire for marriage was for it to endure. And so marriage wasn't just some legal arrangement. It wasn't just a social construct. It was a covenant that was made between man and woman and made between man and woman in covenant with God. And so Walter Wessel in his commentary uh, writes that divorce is the breaking of a seal that has been engraven by the hand of God. That's why it's such a serious matter. That's why Malachi 2.16 says that God hates divorce. Um, when they were in the house again, that is once the Pharisees have left and it's just Jesus and his disciples, uh, the disciples asked Jesus about this and he answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. And you may notice that Mark does not even include uh, the, the clause that includes uh, immorality or unfaithfulness or uh, adultery, as is the case in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has already said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus said it's not just about physical actions, it's about what abides in your heart. And so the, the prohibition against adultery wasn't a license for lust. And then Jesus goes on to say, and it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the cause or the reason of unchastity or unfaithfulness or sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery in that she enters another marriage. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. As that reads in Matthew chapter 19, um, Jesus says in verse 9, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. All of Jesus' answer is to reaffirm that the answer to the Pharisees' question is no. Uh, it was never God's intent uh, for marriage to be disposable. It was never God's intent. Uh, for people to just abandon their marriages, bail on their marriages when things get difficult. Um, they, they are covenants that we make with one another in covenant with God. And that's why our marriages are, are worth uh, fighting for. And our marriages are, are worth seeking help in when we're facing difficulties. Uh, and I know that, that sometimes that unfaithfulness takes place. And I know that there are situations that uh, in, involve severe abuse where divorce may be the only way where a person can be protected. And, and so we, on, the, on the tension that I feel in, in regard to this issue, I've, I've always faced a, a, a tension and a battle between my head and my heart on, on this subject. Uh, and, and my heart uh, causes me to believe and, and to, to uh, definitely affirm that there is life after divorce, uh, there is grace after divorce, there is forgiveness after divorce, uh, but my head constantly reminds me uh, about the seriousness with which God takes marriage. 
and how divorce always brings, regardless of the circumstances, divorce brings pain. Uh, divorce brings hurt. Divorce brings circumstances that, that may continue for the rest of a person's life. And so in opposition to the thinking of, of Jesus's day, uh, in opposition to the thinking of our own day about starter marriages and disposable marriages, God calls us uh, to accept his desire and his plan for marriage. Uh, obviously, we don't have time in a study like this. It's not our intent in going through the Gospel of Mark to talk about every aspect of this. Uh, that's an extended study in and of itself. Uh, and discussing what Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians 7. But uh, it, it behooves all of us uh, to, to seek God's will, to study God's word, and to seek to conform our lives and our hearts and our marriages to his will for our lives and our marriages. Uh, verse 13, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the, the disciples rebuked them. Um, this isn't the first time, the only time this happens. Um, but when Jesus sees this, when he sees his disciples rebuking those who were bringing little children to them, he rebukes the disciples. Uh, he was indignant with them. And he said to them, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, uh, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and, and blessed them. I was back in uh, the previous chapter, chapter 9, verse 36, after he has told his disciples, anyone, this is in verse 35, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. As an example, as a visual aid of the kind of humility that he was talking about, he took a little child whom he placed among them, taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So he says, not only is there value in welcoming these children, ministering to these children, and, and again, I'm so proud of what we do through kids care and new heights and, and our Bible classes, but he says, unless you become like them, you can't receive the kingdom of God. You have to receive it like a little child in simple trusting faith, in humility, and in such tenderness. Jesus takes, I mean, he's the son of God in the flesh. Uh, he has the ability to cast out demons, to heal any sickness and disease, and yet he has time for these children. Uh, those who were old enough to, to be able to remember that moment, I am sure, never forgot that moment for the rest of their lives. Hopefully, as they grew older, they, they came to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Master and Savior and, and the Son of God, but he so tenderly places his hands on them and blesses them. Um, and then a person's humility is put to the test severely put to the test when the man that we call the rich young ruler comes before Jesus. Verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Uh, we call this man the, the rich young ruler. That's a composite description of the man that we gain from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, all three of those gospel writers tell us that this man was rich, uh, or that he was very rich. Uh, Matthew tells us uh, that he was young. Luke tells us that he was a ruler. So we pull all that together and call this man the rich young ruler. And his approach to Jesus in, in Mark's account is, good teacher, what shall I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? In Matthew's account, what good thing 
uh, shall I do that I might in, inherit eternal life? Uh, but here in Mark, good teacher. So Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus isn't saying that he isn't God. Uh, Jesus isn't saying that, that he isn't good, but he's probing this man's understanding of who he is. Did you call me good teacher because you know who I really am? Because you know that only God is good and I am God in the flesh? But he says, in, in regard to eternal life, you know the commandments. And here he goes to the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, uh, recorded in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not de defraud. Honor your father and mother. Again, in Matthew's account in Matthew 19, he adds Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And amazingly, uh, this man declares, teacher, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. I don't know if he had heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I doubt it, because if he had, he wouldn't have been so confident in his keeping of all of these commandments. Probably he had not murdered anybody, but did he bear hatred in his heart for anyone? Maybe he hadn't committed adultery, but did he have lust in his heart? Maybe he hadn't stolen anything, but did he covet the possessions of other people? Did he truly love his neighbor as himself? Uh, had he fully, completely, perfectly honored his father and mother, never disobeyed him? Uh, obeyed them? Excuse me. Um, this man has a high opinion, a high view of his ability to obey the will of God. And in his estimation of his obedience to these commandments in the Decalogue, he had somehow missed the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. And obviously, Jesus knew, knowing this man's heart, that there was something in his life that he had put before God. Um, so Jesus looks at him, and it's not that he wants to drive him away. It's not that the, the demand that Jesus puts on him is designed to totally deflate him and discourage him and cause him to think there's no way I, I can gain eternal life. Jesus is in the saving business. Jesus is in the business of drawing people closer to God. And that's why Mark says he looked at this man and he loved him. He, he wants him to accept uh, the, the teachings of the kingdom of God, but he knows that there's a huge barrier. And he says to him, one thing you lack. Did Jesus mean that there is only one fault in this man's life? I doubt it. I don't think so. But there is one glaring obstacle. There is one huge idol in his life uh, that he has placed above his devotion to God, and that was his wealth. So Jesus says to him, because of his particular problem, his particular idol, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and, uh, excuse me, I lost my place there, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. This echoes what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Uh, young man, brother, uh, you need to store up treasure in heaven and you've got too much stored here on earth. And if, if you want to put God above everything in your life, if you want to follow me and put me above everything, you're going to have to demonstrate that you love me more than you love your wealth. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. The disciples were amazed at his words. Um, Jesus says uh, to, to the disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
and the disciples just can't wrap their brains around that. Aren't the rich rich because God favors them, because God blesses them? Um, aren't the, the Sadducees uh, an aristocratic, wealthy class? Is, is God not pleased with them? Uh, those associated with the high priests uh, who apparently had great wealth, are they not pleasing to God? Can they not enter the kingdom of God? So Jesus continues to say, children, how hard it is uh, to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. We do read about those in the Gospels uh, who were rich, who came to faith in Jesus. Zacchaeus was a rich man who found repentance uh, and found salvation. Jesus said, today salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. Joseph of Cyprus, that we know as Barnabas, was a wealthy man. But Jesus here talks about the great difficulty, and he couches it in language of impossibility. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And so the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Um, if the rich can't be saved, and if it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for them to be saved, then who can be saved? Uh, explanations like there was a low place uh, in the wall of Jerusalem that a camel could not go through upright uh, with a load on its back, but if the load was taken off and the camel got down on its knees, it could wiggle through this place in the wall called the eye of the needle. Interesting explanation. You may even have a tour guide in, in Jerusalem that will try to show you a place like that. Didn't exist in the days of Jesus. Why would you take a camel through a place like that when you could just lead it through an open gate into the city? Jesus isn't describing here. He's not using a figure that describes difficulty. He's describing something that is impossible for a camel to go through a needle's eye, and they pick up on that. So they say, then who can be saved? Jesus says, with man, it's impossible for a rich man to be saved. It's impossible for any man to be saved by their own effort, by their own merit, but with God, all things are possible. Salvation is humanly impossible. God makes it possible through his grace and through his mercy. Um, then Peter, realizing that they had done what this rich young ruler had at least initially, refused to do and, and going away sorrowful, uh, Peter realizes, you know, my brother and Andrew and I left our fishing business to follow you. James and John left their boats, left their nets, left their father, left their hired men and followed you. Levi, Matthew left his tax collecting booth and followed you. We have left everything and followed you. In Matthew 19, he follows that with, what then will there be for us? Um, and he seems to be hinting at um, prominence. He seems to be hinting at position. Jesus will answer that in Matthew 19 with the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. But here, Mark doesn't share that parable, but he answers uh, any concern that Peter and the others might have had about the investment they had made in following Jesus, in leaving everything. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution, uh, in, in the midst of all these blessings you're going to receive, there will be hardships, but you're going to receive all this in this life and in the age to come, eternal life. Um, and you think about, brothers and sisters, the, the blessing that, that we have 
in Jesus Christ. And I know that cost of discipleship for some people is great. Sometimes in following Jesus, uh, it puts them at odds with a spouse who doesn't share their faith in Jesus Christ. It puts them at odds with their parents or with their children or with a brother or with a sister. And, and they may lose that relationship or uh, harmony in that relationship because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of ill will on the disciples' part, but ill will on the part of those who don't accept the faith that they have in Jesus Christ. And yet, in the body of Christ, in the family of God, that is repaid uh, multiple times over a hundredfold, Jesus says. You know, I think about the homes that I have stayed in. Um, as uh, a member of the body of Christ, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, homes that I've stayed in, not because they were my physical family, but because they were my spiritual family, uh, hospitality that I have received in this country and in other countries, hospitality that we've been able to provide to others. Um, I, in, in, in regard to physical family, I had a very small family, uh, just one sister. I uh, love her dearly. There are only two of us. How many brothers, how many sisters do I have in the body of Christ? How many older women who are like mothers to me, older men who are like fathers to me, uh, younger people who are like children to me? And that's just in this life. And in the age to come, eternal life. Uh, so Peter, brothers, sisters, um, don't worry about the investment you've made in following Jesus. Uh, it is a, a safe investment and one that is going to reap eternal rewards. Uh, but then the caution Jesus gives here, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Peter, your investment is safe, but, but be careful about thinking that just because of what you've given up to follow me, uh, that there's necessarily going to be some place of prominence. And so what follows uh, shortly thereafter are those who are seeking those positions of prominence. But before we get there, verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. The disciples were astonished while those who were following were afraid. There was just this sense that, that something ominous was going to happen as they moved toward Jerusalem and the feast of the Passover was drawing near. Again, he takes the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And we've seen before how even though he is speaking so plainly, uh, they struggle in understanding what he is telling them because it is just so antithetical to what they anticipated the Messiah was going to be. Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. In Matthew's account, it's the mother of James and John who comes to Jesus. And they say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. They're asking for a blank check. Uh, it's like when, when your husband or your wife says, hey, would you, be, would you do me a favor? Would you do something for me? You want to be able to say yes, but could you tell me what, what the favor is? Could you tell me what you want me to do? So Jesus asked them, what is it you want me to do for you? They replied, oh, not much. Uh, just let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Uh, we're struggling to understand what you're saying about being handed over to the Gentiles, being uh, spit upon, uh, being killed, being raised on the third day, uh, but we do believe that you are the Christ. We do believe that you're the Messiah. So when your kingdom becomes a reality, we just want the, the top two positions next to you. Um, Jesus says, you, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? 
we can, they answered. And Jesus is talking about the, the cup of suffering, the, the baptism of suffering uh, that, that he was going to, to face. And Jesus says to them, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong uh, for those to those for whom they have been prepared in Matthew's account, uh, to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. And then the other 10 apostles hear about this, and, and they are so angry. They're so indignant with James and John, probably because they got their request in first, because they called dibs before they had the opportunity to do that. So Jesus calls them together and, and says, yet again, I've got to explain to you how things work in the kingdom of God. Remember the little child? Remember the, the children that I took in my arms and laid my hands on and blessed? Remember how I said that um, unless you become the servant of all, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Unless you receive the kingdom of, uh, of God like a child, uh, you, you can't enter it. Let me explain to you again what greatness in my kingdom is all about. Jesus says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great, rather than asking for the... the uh, first and second place next to me, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And then he gives them the greatest example that, that he could give them was the example of himself. Even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He says, don't look at worldly power structures. Don't look at governmental power structures. Don't look at, at power structures in, in the world of commerce. Uh, they exist based on power and wealth and imposition of will. That's not what leadership in my kingdom is about. That's not what greatness in my kingdom is about. It's about becoming the servant of all. Uh, it's an upside down kind of righteousness. It's an upside down kind of values and ethics as compared to those in this world. And so Jesus is going to ultimately show them what it's like uh, to lay down your life for others. Uh, he'll give them a, a visual aid in the upper room by washing their feet, uh, but ultimately in laying down his life for them, giving, him, uh, giving his life as a ransom for many. Uh, we'll go ahead and stop there for today. Uh, we'll pick up with verse 36. Again, I didn't feel compelled to complete the whole chapter today, trying to get through by the end of the month. Scott's given us a little breathing room uh, to take a little more leisurely pace with the study uh, here on out. So thank you again for your time today. We're looking forward to that time of worship this morning together at 10 o'clock, whether you're going to be here in person or viewing through the live stream. Uh, It'll be a time of lifting our voices together in song to the Lord, sharing together in the supper of the Lord, feeding on his word, bringing our petitions and prayers before him. And we pray that all of that will be an honor and a glory um, and a magnification of our God and Father and our Lord and Savior, and that it will be a blessing to our hearts and spirits as well. Uh, God bless you, and we will see you again next week in our study of the Gospel of Mark.